Hey, welcome to the newsroom. I'm Owen Poindexter, senior writer with Front Office Sports. If this is your first time listening to the newsroom, welcome. So glad to have you. Also, you should know that this is not how my voice normally sounds. Uh, my kids were sick all last week, and through some combination of sleep deprivation and getting what they got, I now sound like a frog. Uh, but fortunately, I won't have to do all the talking today because we have our senior writer, Mike McCarthy, joining us to talk about the NBA. The NBA has media negotiations ongoing, and their next deal is going to be absolutely record-breaking. And it's really interesting to look at everything the league is doing right now with an eye toward how they are shaping their product for media companies to be buying in over the next decade. We'll get into that just after this. 2000, 2008, 2022. When it comes to the economy, those are some scary years. Dot-com crash, housing crash, and the roller coaster we're going through right now. But over 31,000 businesses have the confidence and clarity they need because they rely on NetSuite by Oracle, the number one cloud financial system. NetSuite gives you visibility and control of your financials, inventory, HR, planning, and budgeting, so you can manage risk, get reliable forecasts, and improve margins. Everything you need, all in one place. So how do you prepare for uncertain times? The answer, NetSuite. NetSuite helps you identify rising costs, automate your business processes, and easily see where to save money. That's why 93% of customers say they improve their visibility and control when they upgraded to NetSuite. What are you waiting for? Right now, NetSuite is offering a one-of-a-kind flexible financing program. Head to netsuite.com slash the newsroom right now. netsuite.com slash the newsroom. netsuite.com slash the newsroom. All right, we are joined today by our senior writer, Mike McCarthy. How are you doing, Mike? Good. All right, so the NBA season is about a week old. Uh, do you have an NBA team? You, you rooting interest here? <laughs> I love the Knicks. Uh, I'm oh, a native okay. New Yorker, so I've grown up uh, rooting for the Knicks. And rooting for the Knicks has kind of turned into rooting for the Mets. Uh, you know, it's one heartbreak and one change after another. I can't believe we haven't bonded over this. I <laughs> also grew up in New York, also a Knicks and Mets fan. The Mets will at least... What I think is amazing about the Mets is that they will continually inspire hope every year. Yes. Like, you know, you know, whatever you say about the past, this is a good team, obviously this year included. And every year they find a new way to break your heart. The That's Knicks, right. it's, it's like just been flatlined. It's like the, the, the body has not has no pulse and has not for like 20 years. I mean, you know, maybe, well, maybe there's something brewing. Maybe not. Um, but I live in the Bay Area now. And uh, yeah, it, it's like... You know, easy California living out here with the Golden State Warriors, who just have this like joyful team that can't stop winning. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I have I have jumped on the bandwagon happily, and hey, I'll jump back on the Knicks bandwagon when uh, when there's a bandwagon to jump on. <laughs> but, yeah. um, well, you know, it, uh, Owen, it's a, it's a desert for New York sports in general. I'm not trying to pick yeah. on the Knicks. When was the last New York team in any sport that won a championship? Yeah, yeah it's, it's been, been over a, a decade. decade. I just saw. So, was it the yeah. Yankees in 09? Is that the most Yankees in 09? And, you know, uh, maybe uh, the Giants, 2010, Yeah, Yes, one was the, okay, yeah. that was the, the last one, yeah. The second right. Super Bowl of a Brady. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, they, they need, I guess, now that Brady's back, and I guess maybe they, if Eli could come back, they could, they could win again. That's um, right. Uh, all right, so, so let's get into it. The NBA is, um, you know, Doing doing great it seems so far. Uh, they're a super strong league, and uh, they've got some media negotiations coming up. They're the next league to, you know, uh, ha be facing a huge, potentially enormous deal. Uh, so, give me just your kind of your state of the nation of the NBA. Uh, how how's it going for this league? Yeah. Uh, Owen, you put your finger on it. Uh, don't tell me about Big Twelve, Pac twelve, Pac twenty five. I mean, the one big media deal that everybody wants to talk about, everybody has an opinion on, is what is the NBA going to do next? Uh, the NFL signed a huge media deal last year, $110 billion, 10, 11-year deals. And here's the NBA with its current nine-year deal with ESPN and TNT about to run out after the 24-25 season. Now, that sounds like a long time, but leagues like to get these deals done a couple of years in advance. So the negotiations are starting right now. And everybody's wondering, A, who's going to bid on the NBA, and B, how much it will get. So the sense I get, and you will be better informed on me than this, was that they like their relationship with ESPN and Turner. And if they can make it work with those two, then they will. 
Is that kind of what you're feeling? No, I don't. Uh, oh, okay. I, I, I think, uh, you know, they like Turner. Uh, they like ESPN. They've been great partners with the league. They've both been in uh, business with them for decades. But, you know, as the late, great Don Olmeyer used to say, Owen, oh, the answer to all your questions is money. <laughs> uh, I think uh, loyalty aside, you know what I mean? They're not going to get a loyalty discount. And if Amazon or Apple or some giant streamer comes in here and throws billions of dollars more at the NBA uh, than these current linear networks, I think they'll go for it. Yeah, I was about to ask you about Amazon and Apple specifically. I mean, we always throw out the tech giants, but until Google makes a real move, I'm just going to keep saying Amazon and Apple. Right, right. Uh, so, yeah, is there, I assume their presence is being felt because they seem to be at least lingering around every major media deal these days. Yeah, I mean, what's really interesting here, Owen, is it's, it's kind of a sports history repeating itself. Uh, 20 years ago, uh, NBC was the incumbent on the NBA. I don't know. You, you got to be sort of my generation, but those were... Yeah, I remember uh, NBA and NBC. You know, oh, my God. Time. It was fantastic. You know, uh, Bob Costas and Round Bull Rock and Michael Jordan. It, it was just fantastic. But at the time, when the rights became up, ESPN was the deep-pocketed company uh, that NBC couldn't compete against. And the reason for that is that ESPN had a dual revenue stream. They had both subscriber fees and advertising, whereas... NBC had just advertising. So it was uh, a sharp on your pencil negotiation and the ESPN won. Now history is repeating itself. ESPN is the incumbent and they could be competing against a company like Amazon or Apple that's literally worth trillions of dollars and could throw billions at the NBA in a heartbeat. So it's going to be fascinating. And how about, you know, the like NBC, CBS, I don't know, Fox maybe, ABC. I guess ABC is ESPN. Um, but are are they going to have any presence here, you think? Definitely. I mean, I, I would definitely expect NBC to uh, try to get back into it. You know, NBC kind of misses the NBA in a way that CBS missed the NFL when it lost the NFL. And I, I think in their heart of hearts, uh, NBC would love to get back into the NBA business. The NBA is a global league. It has a young fan base. It's a terrific technology forward company. So NBC would love to uh, be in that business. Fox, I'll, I'll believe them uh, when I see it. And I think, uh, you know, Disney and ABC are basically focused on keeping their package, which is held by sister Disney company ESPN. Yeah. So, and I, I'm glad you brought up the demographics of the NBA fan because and we've got, so the NFL had its mega, mega deal, the NBA is next. But when you think about the fan bases, they're pretty different. Um, the NFL is kind of, I think, skews a bit older, not baseball old, but yeah. older than the NBA. And NFL's got a growing presence in Europe, whereas the NBA is younger and it's huge in China. Uh, so how does that kind of impact how these companies are looking at that, that audience and getting these rights? It's a huge plus for Adam Silver because, you know, he could go to these leagues and these giant streamers and say, you know what? Everybody says young people aren't watching sports anymore. Well, guess what? You know, we got three billion impressions from our social media feeds and we've got young fans all over the world. And we've got a, a tech forward audience that doesn't have a problem with streaming or all this stuff. They're not old footy duds like the NFL you know what I mean? Where if the game isn't on Channel 5, they're screaming their heads off and calling the cable company. You know, these are these are young, tech-savvy. They love the internet. They love clips. They love social media. And, and that is a very, very desirable audience. I mean, I, I don't want to bore you with Madison Avenue speak, but they always call that on Madison Avenue the so-called 18 to 34-year-old audience. Sure, uh, yeah. Advertisers love the 18 to 34-year-old audience because that's when people are... Uh, married and creating families and starting to form brand choices that will, you know, carry maybe through the rest of their life. So if you can get them at that age, you know, that's the perfect time to get them because, you know, if they're going to buy a Cadillac or whatever at that age, they might buy five Cadillacs, you know, through the rest of their life. Right. And those kids they're having, you know, could get brought into that league. And I think when people say, you know, that group isn't watching sports, they're not watching as much baseball. They're not watching as much golf. There, there are certain legacy sports that um, that have been around a long time. Yeah. But, yeah, the NBA is this perfect bridge where, yeah, it's, 
it's it's very popular a generation or two ago, and it only seems to be getting more so. Yeah. Um, the league is and, it's and interesting. Owen, if I could, if I could just make one more point, you know, don't Please. don't buy the happy talk that's coming from these networks and these leagues. This is an existential threat to sports media. Every single person, if you gave them a truth serum, said, "What is the biggest worry you have?" It's that younger people aren't sitting down and watching a game for two or three hours yeah. anymore. And yeah, well, yeah, the two three hours thing I think is key. Right. They'll watch for two three minutes, they'll and they're not highlights. watching the ads, right? Right, right? So if if you're uh, if you're just watching highlights or if you're just going you know house or whatever to get your clips, you're not watching the Cadillac ad, you're not watching the Anheuser Busch ad, you're not watching the Miller ad, uh, and that's what. Uh, pays the freight for these networks. So they got to get people, particularly young people, to sit in front of their TVs like the old days and watch games. Yeah, and I think it's an under-discussed part of the cord-cutting phenomenon is that I, I'm not used to seeing ads anymore. And okay. I have young kids. I don't want them seeing ads. Ads are yeah. like, I can curate their experience in a way, you know, getting the, and I love like watching sports with my kids, but yeah. I don't want them seeing the ads. That's when like you see ads for horror movies and have to cover their eyes all of a sudden. <laughs> So, but yeah, I mean, regardless of my kids, um, people these days, I think if, if you, if your media consumption is, you know, Netflix, maybe Disney plus, maybe another streaming service or two, you're not used to seeing ads and they feel exactly. very intrusive. And, you know, one reason I love having Thursday night football on Amazon is I can just watch a little bit after the game. And when it comes to right. an ad, just you hit that 30 second button a couple of times and, uh, right. you know, we're off to the races. Um, and so, Owen, what, hap what happens when networks and media companies get desperate because nobody's watching it? I'll tell you what happens. You get a flying dragon during the <laughs> Major League Baseball playoffs where Bob Costas is looking at this piece of paper like, am I really supposed to read this? And Lauren Shahadi looks like, you know, she wants to crawl under the table and die because she's involved in this hokey, cheesy, in-game promotion because people aren't watching the commercials uh, during the commercial breaks. Yeah. Um, as Mets fans, I think one thing we are blessed with is fantastic broadcasters. And I just love right. how he rose. Kind of, you can like hear the sarcasm in his voice, even though he's like giving you an honest ad read. He's, he's doing right. his job. But you can just hear the attitude just buried in there that he can't quite iron out. Um, so the NBA is... I think it's really interesting to look at what it's got in in terms of you know potential media deals on its on its horizon because right. they are they do seem to be trying to clean up certain issues with the league. The league's obviously it, it's it's super popular, it's doing great, um, but it does have a couple issues, um, and um, one of them had Commissioner Adam Silver made a very interesting comment about just the other day. Uh, he was addressing Phoenix Suns employees because the yep. Suns have been going through some stuff. We can get into that if we like. But um, uh, the subject of tanking came up. And in the NBA, I think probably more than any other league, tanking, losing intentionally, uh, makes the most sense. Because you can have players like LeBron James, Kobe Bryant, who yes. just step into the league and are immediate, yeah. you know, not just like all-stars. They can alter the the shape of the league. Yeah. Um, and... Uh, and so when one of those players is coming and you could be the, if you really give it your all, you're the, say, the seventh worst team in the league. Well, maybe right. you, you start some aging veterans or you, uh, you know, you try some young guys who aren't, are improving. Whatever, you, you shuffle around your lineups a little bit. I'm not suggesting yeah. anyone is missing shots or anything that, like that intentionally, but I think it's, it's pretty well documented that teams will, you know, usually through lineup changes, injuries, that kind of thing, uh, who's, who's in, who's out will um, allow their team to lose more than they might so that they yeah. have that, a better shot. So um, Silver brought up the idea of promotion and relegation along the lines of European <laughs> soccer with G League teams replacing the bottom one or two NBA teams. Uh, it's, it's not going to happen anytime soon, but it was, he said the league is looking into it, and I found that very fascinating. Well, Adam Silver has long been one of the best commissioners in sports, and personally, Owen, I think it's a great idea. Uh, you know, the NBA does have some problems that they need to address. I mean, they're in good shape, but they're not in great shape. Uh, and until they get some of those problems ironed out, you know what I mean, they're not going to fulfill their potential. And one of the biggest problems is the idea of tanking. Uh, I see no reason why uh, an American sport like the NBA can't borrow an idea from Europe or Asia or Africa or whatever. I mean, certainly you know, the idea of relegation works in Europe. 
Uh, teams have to stay competitive or you're out. Uh, you know, these uh, owners, uh, you know, most of them are uh, honest brokers, but some of them like to play games, uh, play games with their fans and, you know, fan, play games with their audience. And I think that would be a real uh, bulwark against that. Here's the other uh, uh, huge problem facing the NBA is the players themselves are devaluing the regular season. You know, you've got this uh, real serious problem with players sitting out games with injuries that may or may not be an injury or coaches just deciding that they're going to rest players. Now, if you're uh, paying hundreds of dollars to bring your family to a game and some big star is sitting at the game, you know, because Greg Popovich wants to give him a night off, you know what I mean? You're not going to be very happy. And if you're watching a national telecast on TNT uh, or uh, ESPN and, you know what I mean, it's Lakers and so-and-so and and the big stars you tuned in to watch are sitting there in street clothes, you're going to be pretty pissed off. And uh, I think that's a real problem for the NBA. Uh, They're devaluing their regular season. Uh, it's a and this is uh, at the foot at the doorstep of the players and the coaches, and it's going to become like college football bowls where the best players don't play because they don't want to get hurt. And uh, you know if that's the way uh, it keeps going, they're going to have a real problem on their hands. Yeah, and the tricky thing about it is I totally get it from the teams and players' perspective. And the they the NBA um, I think tried to deal with part of this on the bottom end of the playoff bracket with the play in tournament. Where right. it's not just, you know, one through eight makes the playoffs, it's one through five is in the playoffs and six through ten has to play a couple games to determine those yeah. last, last two spots. Uh, but yet there are those little middle grounds where it's like if you know, you could be the maybe the number two seed, you could really fight for it. Or yeah. you could say we're probably just as good with the number three seed, maybe even the number four seed, right. but we'll come into the playoffs fresh. Right. Like, there, there's... You know, I, I could see teams absolutely making that trade off or, you know, a star player. They said, yeah, I, I'll make the playoffs every year. Who, who cares about that? I, I want the championship. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that that's a tough one to swallow um, or just a tough one to handle, not swallow. But, um, yeah, when, when you have a, a league where about half the teams make the playoffs, you're going to have right. um, both teams on both ends saying, you know, I don't need to win every single game because I right. want to stay fresh, and teams below the playoff line saying, we're not making the playoffs anyway. Let, let's try to get a superstar in the draft instead of the number yeah. eight pick. Let's, we could get a shot at number one. Um, yeah, I mean, it's one of those things where, look, I can understand it. I mean, you know, who's to say who's really hurt or not? You know, sure. Bill Parcells... And probably every, to, everyone's, like, a little bit hurt all the time. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And Bill Parcells used to say, are you hurt or are you injured? It's two different things. You know, playing hurt, everybody has to play hurt during the season. I just think from talking to people around the league, I think there's other ways to deal with it. Perhaps you can lighten the load of these stars and practices. Perhaps you can do other things to help their bodies recover where, you know what I mean, when showtime comes, you know what I mean, you want them on the floor at Madison Square Garden or sure. wherever. You don't want them sitting there in street clothes, uh, you know, because they decided they need a break. I, I don't think fans have any tolerance for that i don't think they have any patience for it to tell you the truth i don't think silver has any patience for it or if he did it's running out quickly yeah and it's a really star driven league too yeah it's a league you know it's one of those leagues where it's very hard to win without a couple stars on your roster right. you know occasionally you get these like really nicely balanced you know five five or seven guy rotations where everyone's just like pretty good and they all work really yeah. well together but mostly the teams winning it all have a two or three superstars yeah. And um, and so yeah, teams want to keep them fresh, and um, and, and those are the guys that fans are there there to see. Like if yeah. I go to a Warriors game, yeah, I want to see Steph Curry. That's like right. I love Clay Thompson. You know, I I sort of begrudgingly at this point <laughs> love Draymond Green, but yeah. um, the, the after he punched Jordan Poole, I'm not sure. But um, anyway, <laughs> I want to see Steph. I want to see him yeah. taking crazy shots. Uh, the league has, and this is, I think, going to tie in a number of things we, we've talked about because I could see players trying to get out of this. I could see it being a draft incentive. The league seems very interested in a midseason tournament where the regular season stops for I'm not sure how long. And 
some number of teams, maybe all of them, maybe just like a top eight in each league or something, have some tournament with some kind of incentive at the end, maybe just some money for the winners. Maybe what I think would be a good idea is a high draft pick for, for the yep. winners. So if you're one of these top teams, you're, you know, you know, a top three team in the league, you're not going to get a nice draft pick, but you can get excited for, um, for the tournament because this gives you a chance to score something like that. Uh, money would be less exciting because I mean, one for the fans, if you're like, okay, Chris Paul gets another million dollars, like, <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> I was a Suns fan. I'm not a Suns fan, but right. if I was, I wouldn't, wouldn't get excited about that. Um, but, but yeah, if there was something where the team itself could be improved, uh, or maybe even something with playoff positioning, I'm just spitballing at this point. Um, and anyway, how do you feel the midseason tournament could, um, um, maybe address some of these issues, maybe make them worse. And also it's obviously relevant given, um, the media negotiations that are coming up. Again, like uh, relegation, I think it's a great idea. I think there's two things that are at work here. One is the first third of the NBA schedule is a problem because it's going up against so many other sports. It's going up against the NFL. It's going up against college football. It's going up against the Major League Baseball playoffs. It's going up against the start of uh, NHL season. I mean, I can go on and on and on and on. Uh, but that first third of the NBA season, that October, November, December schedule is very difficult for people to get excited about because people just have this attitude that the games don't matter as much. I mean, there's a kind of a unofficial belief around the league that, you know, the league doesn't really start until Christmas Day, right? Mm -hmm. And I've seen some people, including Charles Barkley and even some team executives say, you know what, let's move the schedule. Yeah. If Christmas Day is the unofficial start of the NBA season, let's start on Christmas Day. Right. right? Yeah, it's not like hockey where it's like gets awkward yeah. when it's like really warm at the end of the yeah. year. Keep it, keep it, keep the the season going into July, when all you're up against is uh, the dog days of baseball and, and football mm -hmm. is long over. Uh, yeah. And you know the NBA can't sit still. That's why I, I love your idea of the the mid season tournament. You know because everybody's coming for that. You know the NFL takes no prisoners. Uh, yeah. Our entire lives. Uh, sports has been dominated on Christmas Day by uh, the NBA. Well, guess what? Guess who's uh, planning their first triple header uh, on Christmas? The good old NFL. So the NFL isn't going to sit back and you know respect anybody, including the NBA, which is why I think it would be smart for the NBA to continue to innovate and try new ideas. And the good thing about them is they're the league that's most likely to do that. You know, they're not as hidebound or as traditional as baseball. The NBA and Silver are always willing to try something new. Yeah. Yeah, and no, I, I think it could be fun. And, and right, I, that is something I like about the NBA is, you know, they seem very willing willing to try stuff. Um, yeah, like it, the bubble. Um, I mean. Right, right. Uh, um, they're always willing to, uh, to try new things and, uh, you know, experiment uh, during the All-Star break. And uh, and also to your point about a mid-season tournament, that would be a juicy little TV property, right? Sure, exactly. It would be something new. Uh, it would be something that the NBA can use in its negotiations as leverage with bidders, uh, mm -hmm. as a real goodie that you could throw in there. And I'll, I'll give you a perfect example. We just did a story, uh, Owen, uh, in front office sports about uh, the NFL giving Amazon uh, a Black Friday game. Now, that wasn't a part of, uh, you know, the package. They just created this out of the blue. But it was a nice little uh, juicy goodie for Amazon to bid on. According to Peter King, they probably paid 75 to $100 million for the game. And it creates uh, a new window for the NFL. Uh, so, you know what I mean? If the NBA could create new properties for itself that it can monetize and new programming windows, uh, I think I'd be all for it. And man, I can't imagine a more like perfect storm for Amazon of an NFL game on Black Friday because Black Ugh. Friday is already like this consumer bonanza for Amazon. Yeah, and uh, yeah, you're you're watching football, you're you're buying your Christmas gifts. Um, it, it's it, all in, it, on one screen. It is brilliant. It, it is absolutely brilliant. It's insidiously brilliant, Owen. Uh, not only do they have people now shopping and watching football on Black Friday, but they're also telling you, hey. Don't go to Walmart on Black Friday. You don't want to deal with those crowds. Just shop on Amazon and Cyber Monday. We'll, we'll take care of everything. Meanwhile, I know, I... day after Thanksgiving, you know, loosen your belt, kick back, have some leftovers, watch some football. Yeah, you know, I 
I don't know how to feel about Amazon as a company, but it's a very enticing offer that, that they put yeah. out there sometimes. Um, I, I just want to jump quickly back to the, the idea of people devaluing the, the beginning of the NBA season just because it makes me yeah. think about how people often think about NBA games is like, you know, whatever, it's just going to be like 85, 84 in the fourth quarter, and that's when you can really tune in, like see right, who gets right. the final three, which I I don't know if I agree with, but, um, but I think that perception is really out there that it's – the, the fourth quarter is when, when it all comes together. Yeah. Um, and you can kind of just wait until then. Um, side note, but I can't resist mentioning, have you heard of the Elam ending? This proposal no. for, it's, I love it. It's uh, I, And I think it's been tried in, uh, I'm not sure which league, maybe the G League. Some, some like lower level basketball league has tried this. Um, it's this proposal to deal with, and it's mostly to deal with like the endless fouling at the end of NBA, NBA games, which right. is like not a great... Uh, thing to watch. Uh, once you kind of get used to it, then you're used to it, but it's it's not a great product. The Elam ending is this idea that at something like three minutes before the end of the fourth quarter, the clock stops, and then you are playing to whatever the winning team points... Sorry, if the, so let's say the winning team has 100 points at that point. Let's say it's 195. Then you're playing to 107. You're playing to 7 plus whatever the winning team has. And so you can like end the game on a big slam dunk. The, there can be a, a comeback <laughs> if the losing team goes on a crazy run. Uh, and there's no incentive to do the whole fouling thing. And you right. end the, the game three minutes before... You stop the clock three minutes before the, the fourth quarter ends so that the game takes about the same amount of time. Anyway, right. I'm really hoping that the NBA tries this maybe in an all-star game or something. <laughs> um, side note, but couldn't resist there. Uh, all right, so before we get yeah, out of here... And, and that's a great ahead. point. I mean, let them you know try it during all-star weekend, four-point shots and all that craziness. Yeah. You know, see what works. I mean, we're old enough to remember when you know the three-point shot wasn't that much of a weapon. Right. You know, it, it had just come into the league, and, you know, there were a couple of stars like, you know, Ly Bird, who were good at it, and Craig Hodges, who were specialists. But it wasn't a three-point shooting league. You know what I mean? It grew into that because the NBA was willing to experiment and add the three-point shot, and it revolutionized the game. Uh, you know, it turned it into a smaller man's game, a Steph Curry league, instead of the old giants uh, who mm -hmm. used to dominate the NBA. But yeah, you think of you think of you know Michael Jordan continually defeating the Knicks in the playoffs as yeah. we watched so many times. What was he doing? He, I mean, yes, he took threes, but mostly he was just driving around people. It was like driving and pass off to the big guy who does a little dink shot in. Um, and yeah, now it's now it's the Currys and the Clays. Right. All right. So the NBA, so ESPN and Turner are currently paying around two point six billion dollars per year. Correct. Um, the NFL got around ten billion dollars per year in their deals. What do you think the NBA is looking at for its next set of media deals? I think if you take it again, another nine or 10 year deal, I think it's going to be between 50 to $75 billion in total. Mm -hmm. uh, I think they're going to double, perhaps triple their current media rights fee. Triple. So, you know, if they're getting two and a half billion, you know, now it could be over seven a year, uh, close to eight. Uh, I may be crazy. Uh, I just think that live sports, as somebody said, is the, the building block that's holding together the, the Jenga of the TV economy. And, you know, besides the NFL, there's no live sports rights that are more valuable than the NBA for all the reasons we've discussed today. The younger audience, the global appeal. Uh, and as far as the streamers, here's something to chew on if you're uh, TNT and ESPN. They're already streaming the NBA. They've got a deal, a streaming deal in China that reaches 500 million people. And guess what? What did uh, you know, uh, the Clippers just do? They launched their own streaming service. I mean, for the reason that why do another cable network? Everybody should move to streaming. So, uh, you know, the, the streaming option is becoming more and more of an option for that. And that is going to drive the rights fees through the roof. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I think... You know, 70, 75 billion is is very in the realm of possibility. Especially, I mean, the NFL is out of the way, too. You're, there's no, like, waiting around to see, like, you know, maybe we'll miss out on this, but get a nice deal from the NFL. I mean, all these networks yeah. have deals with the NFL. But, um, you know, that's that's in the books. And, yeah, they would really like to have something, especially because they have somewhat different schedules. There's the overlap right now. But uh, come spring, yeah, it's going to be early baseball. NHL playoffs are, are going to, you know, be around the same time. But... Yeah, the real big ticket's going to be the NBA, yeah. especially after March Madness is done. 
and, and a lot of the chess pieces are off the board. The NFL is the, the king and the queen. That's off the board. They're locked up for the next nine, ten years. The NHL is locked up for the next uh, seven years. The Big Ten Conference, you know, I mean, it just signed the most valuable uh, pact in uh, college sports. So really, what is there left to bid on the next couple of years? You know what I mean? you got the NBA uh, you know, you've got the the college football uh, championship coming up. Other than that, it's a lot of college conferences and, and this and that. The NBA is the big one. Yeah, yeah, and it's going to be fascinating. But uh, yeah, well, glad to have you here to give us the play by play on just how many billions are getting thrown around here. Mike, thanks so much for joining us. My pleasure. Anytime, guys. Thank you. Thanks so much for listening to the newsroom. Join us every single Thursday. We'll be coming at you with our just top-notch FOS staff here, bringing you insights and analysis that you're not going to get anywhere else. Also, uh, check out our other podcasts, My Other Passion, with our editor-in-chief, Ernest Baker, interviewing sports figures, both about the stuff you know about them and a lot of stuff you don't know about them. And keep up with all the sports business news out there through the lead-off. It comes at you every day, just a quick five minutes or less to keep you up to date on the biggest stories in the sports business world. We'll see you next week.